The recording started. We're ready to go. All right. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the quarterly meeting of the Coastal Resilience Technical Advisory Committee. I'm Matt Wells, I'm the Director of the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Uh, acting this morning on behalf of Chief Resilience Officer and Secretary of Natural Resources, Travis Phillips, who was able to make the meeting. Um, we have a, a jam-packed agenda today uh, and several more resilience-related meetings to follow today and, and tomorrow. Uh, so we will we will get going. Um, we're going to start. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Just go around the table real fast. It's name and the organization. Darren Stewart, NRVA. Lily Lark, Open Up Coffee Meeting. Mike Fitch, Virginia Transportation Research Council. Rebecca Murphy, Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Meredith Keppel, Drew Bartman Regional Commission. Uh, John Bateman, Wetlands Watch. Eric Garcia, Wetlands Watch. Cameron Burgess, Nathan, Indian Nation. Chris Swanson, B. Hot. Robin Coach, B. Dead. Mark Lucas, Mark Virginia, Student Rain Slide. Matt Wolf, PCR. Phil Curtis, Department Housing Community Development. Jay Ellington, Crater, PDC. Martin Moore, Virginia Frontier. Gerald Glover, DCR. Carol Ponsonine, ODU, ICAR. Michael Perez, Diversity, Opportunity, and Inclusion. Sean Crumless, Virginia Resources Authority. Troy Hartley, Virginia Sea Grant. George Weiss, Virginia Tech. And that's DCR staff in Houston. Uh, Matt Allen, DCR. Carolyn Heath, Sakara. And we've also uh, pleased to say that uh, we are now working with VCU's PMG group to help uh, facilitate uh, this TAC as well as the, uh, the working group. So I have some of the so. I'm Sarah Jackson from VCU, Center for Public Policy. Wheeler Wood, also with Center for Public Policy at VCU. Happy, happy to have them uh, pitching in on this. Uh, We've got a couple people online. A couple people online. All right. Tech members online. We have uh, Jessica Steelman from ACMAC Northampton, DEC, uh, Zach Widget from DMRC, and Joe Howe from the Navy. All right. Uh, just a reminder for any of the public that wants to make comment at the end of the meeting, uh, there is a sign-up sheet over there, uh, and then Matt has a sign-up online. If you want to uh, provide public comment virtually, uh, please enter your name and information in the chat, noting that you'd like to provide public comment. Great. All right. Um, so we will move down the agenda. Uh, the first item of business is the adoption of the meeting minutes from the March meeting. Those have been posted online. Uh, I assume everyone has read them and digested them. Uh, I get a motion to adopt the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Matt Dallin. Actually, first of all, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put next to the tackles and responsibilities for fast. So for the agenda today, uh, we'll hear a number of reports from DCR staff. Uh, we've got some old business, uh, including some proposed tax charter changes that we will talk about today. We're not going to vote on those today. Uh, and then some new business items that we'll go over. Just a reminder of the roles and the responsibilities of the TAC. Uh, essentially, this group has been formed to help support uh, the department in our efforts to update the coastal resilience master plan. Uh, we are also authorized to call on you to help uh, support the Virginia flood protection master plan. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about both of those today. So with that, the Matt Allen show. Take it away. Thank you, Greg Wells. Welcome all tech members and public. Um, on to the next slide. So first up, is an update on the Coastal Resilience Master Plan uh, for Phase 2 progress. Primarily, the Coastal Resilience Web Explorer User Portal update, as well as the Fluvial Modeling update. So, all the presentations you have copy in your handouts, and we'll go along and get into the screen set so well. Uh, first off, Coastal Resilience Web Explorer User Portal update on the screen is uh, where we're at. Project schedule started in January um, with mock up and design that made it through our initial development and are about to begin our internal user testing and then some external user testing uh, later this month. Uh, and then we'll be able to deploy our user portal um, in the end of August, early September, and then after it's deployed, start 
rolling out some virtual trainings on how different users can work with our online web school explorer portal um, and start adding and entering private data as well as funding information into our online web explorer database. Um, this schedule also includes a one-time bulk upload of uh, projects that we're getting from the PDCs that they're working on and granting through DEQ's Coastal Zone Management Program. Uh, so that's scheduled to happen end of August, beginning of September for this project. Just a couple of slides to show you a preview of what the new Web Explorer user portal looks like. Um, this is kind of the home page for projects and initiatives where you, different users, um, based on what projects you're responsible for, will see a summary of the projects listed, and then you can double click and go into more details. Um, one item that's highlighted on the screen in the bottom is uh, the ability to report out from this uh, user database. So you can download a report on your projects and initiatives as well as funding um, initiatives as well. So this is another feature that we want to uh, make this user explore, uh, resilience book explore that can have all the coastal resilience projects and initiatives, something that works for you all as well. Hopefully it can help you um, manage uh, your projects that you are creating. So if you were to click on the project, here's another view of the detail of the information. Again, able to see what information you have currently entered. Um, and then if you want to edit your data, you're able to go into an edit mode and type in new information, um, hoping that this can be online, on demand. You can enter when you have new information, when you have a new update, or create a new project. Um, this is what this tool is what we're working on right now. There is the opportunity for future enhancements and development um, after we roll this out. This is a long-term process, but this was our next step in the Coastal Resilience Web Explorer. If you recall, last, actually, it's two summers ago, in 20, summer of 21, we had a six-week window to enter all your projects in through survey one, two, three. Um, so this is replacing that functionality so that you can see your projects, update them, export them, and hopefully help. You all manage them and give us visibility on what projects are planned, what initiatives are planned, as well as to see where are the gaps, where aren't there projects and initiatives for us to try to figure out why is there a gap there and what needs to be done. Any questions on the filters and web explorer update before we need to include your model? Uh, Food modeling update. So in front of you is where we're at with the current schedule. Um, we are on schedule and moving forward. Uh, pilot study results uh, should be coming out later this next month, so in a couple weeks, mid July. Uh, we have about a six week review period to review the results, review the process, and then discuss as a group is this working for us? Are, do we need to make any changes before we go to full production? So this is a critical time. We're looking for input. Um, the interim technical memos have gone to the Research Data Innovation Subcommittee. And we'll talk more about the subcommittees later uh, this morning. Uh, it's also gone out to a group of uh, different stakeholders that are interested in uh, Google modeling effort and looking to provide comments. So if there's any money that wants to be added to that list, please let us know. We can add more people uh, to it. Um, we will be working on scheduling some review meetings for later in July and early August to discuss the final results. Um, once we are good with the pilot results and the plans move forward, uh, we're scheduled to complete this uh, fluid modeling effort in the spring of 2020. So a couple slides, uh, just giving a preview of what uh, some of the early pilot results look like. Um, on the left is a Hub 12 watershed basin. 
There's about 440 of these in the coastal, the eight coastal PDCs. Um, we're modeling all of these, uh, but within that up 12, it's broken down into smaller sub basins, around five to seven square miles per sub basin. Um, and then we are running different rainfall precipitation events over that terrain to try to identify where flooding is likely to occur. On the right is an example of a flood inundation map with uh, depths there ranging from zero to about nine to ten feet in the rain. Um, and this is for a 24-hour roughly year worst case RCP 8.5 scenario. But at this scale, you're seeing where uh, inundation ponding is occurring um, within a residential area before it's making its way to open water conveyances. So these are some of the results we'll be looking at with the pilot results and the peer review uh, moving forward. Um, we have received comments on interim technical memos one and two, and, and interim technical memo three is currently uh, being reviewed, and we'll discuss that with the uh, pilot study. Uh, Results. I wanted to point um, a couple of the key uh, comments that we received and provide some feedback to those. Uh, we did provide a comment matrix back to the review group um, on all the comments that they submitted after talking to you very uh, with them. Uh, we do plan on revisiting these once we have the results in front of us. Uh, so that was a few of our comments. We acknowledge them. We are considering some different options, but uh, want to bring them all back together. One was on the topographic data. Are we using uh, best available liner data? The FDR, we are using the best available publicly available liner data. And so, if a small, if a locality or somebody else went out and collected liner data, but it's not only uh, available publicly, we did not use that, but we are using the most current um, USGS provided data. And have updated the uh, digital elevation model from the Coastal Resilience Master Plan study. There were a couple uh, new locations where data was going. Uh, we are looking at the resolution. We have stuck with a uh, 10 meter grid cell for the Fugo modeling to match what we did with the coastal storm modeling in phase one. Um, but there were some comments whether we should be using one meter, two meter, or different resolutions. Um, so that's one thing we will consider. Another question was the land use cover data set that we are using. So we are using uh, the 2019 National Land Cover data set. That data set is a 30 meter resolution, so about 100 feet. Um, there is different data sets available. Uh, and those were brought up in the comments. One is uh, the Chesapeake Bay land use land cover data set. That uses older imagery, 2017, 2018, but at a much higher resolution at um, the one meter resolution versus our 30 meter. Uh, there is also the Virginia state land cover data set, which uses 2016 imagery, so even older, but that's full coverage within our project area, again, the one meter resolution. So there's some trade-offs between how new is the aerial imagery, which drives a lot of the land use cover data set versus the resolution. And the Chesapeake Bay data set is only in Chesapeake Bay watershed, and our project extends beyond the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So there's some different pros and cons. And if you look on the image to the right, there's an aerial imagery. The center of the image is what the national land cover data looks like. And then the image on the right, the higher resolution, um, I think that's the Virginia State Land Cover Data Set. But when you go back and look at the results, and this is what we want to do really, is we discuss a lot of the inputs, but have the outputs in front of us to discuss what does it mean to what we're really looking for as the innovation. Is it going to cause a significant change if we increase the resolution of that input? Are we, really, are we getting more accurate or are we still going to see data? So that's what we're waiting to see where we're at with data in front of us to discuss 
uh, the land use and the topic area. Uh, there was another comment on the open boundary conditions. So where is say one of our clubs in some basins is draining to a tide water level fluctuates over time and also steering storm surge at the elevated river storm winds. For this modeling effort, we are right now for the pilot study using the mean high water elevation. It will be projected forward where we have future rainfall scenarios. So where we're looking at 2050 to 2100, we will be looking to mean high water at projection that represents what it could be during that time frame, but we're not looking to have elevated um, tidal boundary conditions based on storm surge for this model. But we are providing an open, these models openly and they will be readily available for download. So people could make those changes and rerun the model. It's an open source model that anybody can download and run and we do plan on you all want that in the green. We plan to put it in the user's guide as far as giving information on how you can run different scenarios with the model so you can test it yourself. Um, on every technical amendment number two, the climate scenarios, there was some discussion of what scenario we're we using. Um, we have Marissa data for running three different projections to move forward. So here's what the pilot study modeling overview looks like. Um, three different locations, seven different turn intervals, and three different client scenarios using the rest of it. Um, this rest of data is an adjustment factor on current Atlas 14. And so it's projecting out 2020 to 2070 with RCP 4.5 and 8.5. We're using the 8.5 in the short term now. And then the median values, longer term, 2050 to 2100, looking at 4.5, 8.5. This couples us to the Atlas 14 projections. Um, and before I get to that, this is what it looks like for a two hour to 24 hour duration. This is enrichment on what those different um, precipitation events look like over a term period on the X axis and then the rainfall on Y. You know, see some clustering in the points. Each point represents one of the different climate scenarios. So we'll be having data for rainfall that's, if you look at the far left, 1.8, 1.9, 2, 2.1, 2.2. So just a tenth of an inch. We'll look at the pilot results and we're going to see is it worth having all the data or should we try to? Come to more of an interval based rainfall event that gets us uncoupled from Atlas 14 to give us some more shelf life. Uh, and this is something we want to discuss with research data and innovation and stuff. So bring that up because no Atlas 14 is currently getting updated. Uh, those results for Virginia are scheduled to be completed around 2025. Again, yeah, our data is scheduled to come out in the spring of 2024. So new Atlas 14 projections come out 25, and then Atlas 15 comes out in 2026, which has the non stationary to it. How much shelf life does our current data have? We're tied to this. So, should we look at trying to extend the shelf life of our data and using more interval based um, rainfall scenarios that we then have to cross walk to the different? Projections. And the projections get updated. You can update a crosswalk and don't necessarily get have to rerun the models. So that's something we want to discuss again with the research data and patient subcommittee. Um, also look through it in our pilot study results before we go to full production and do all the modeling across all eight results. Any questions on who do modeling? Next up uh, are some other ECR updates. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Director Wells to cover the Office of Resilience Planning, Medicine Flood Resilience Report, 
resilience coordination working group, and then flood fund and resilient Virginia revolving. All right, I'm going to give Matt a break. Uh, so some organizational updates here at DCR on Wendy Howard Cooper, um, who many of you know and have worked with, uh, who is the uh, Division of Dam Safety and Floodplain Management Director, uh, has parted over to our friends at VDOT. And so we are going to be reorganizing that division into three uh, distinct parts, um, a division of dam safety, a uh, division of floodplain management, and then an office of resilience planning. Um, that Matt Dowling will be heading up. All of those will continue to report to Daryl Glover, um, but just looking at kind of the scope of responsibility of that division director position, it was a lot for, for one position. So we decided that um, splitting it in, into three while keeping it in the same uh, department within the agency was the appropriate move. Um, there is going to be a new Office of Resilience Planning webpage uh, that's going to come out next month, right? Um, I think uh, some good stuff in there that hopefully folks will uh, find valuable. Uh, so status of flood resilience report. This is a statutory requirement uh, for the chief resilience officer uh, to report to the governor and the General Assembly uh, on a number of things, including the evaluation of flood protection for critical infrastructure, uh, identifying risks, and including the status of uh, flood resilience planning. Um, the first one is scheduled for release next month. And then it's required to be updated every two years after that. Um, looking at the requirements of this report and what we are trying to do with phase two of the Coastal Resilience Master Plan, um, we realized that we were running in parallel with some of the efforts that BDM uh, was doing with regards to their critical infrastructure assessment. And so our goal here is to try to coordinate those two efforts so that we're not doing the same thing in a slightly different manner as BDM. So a lot of this report will be um, status updates and then teeing up how we intend to capture, uh, capture that in the future. Matt, did I miss anything on that? All right. Uh, Resilience Coordination Working Group, I know a number of you all have been following this. It's actually meeting later today. So this was a group that was established um, administratively uh, to talk about how we can do a better job of coordinating our resilience efforts across state agencies uh, with our localities and how we can do a better job of pulling down federal funds. Um, we have been meeting monthly since January uh, and we'll report out in, in November. Um, I think we've had some really productive discussions there um, about how we can restructure uh, our efforts right now. Uh, resilience efforts are split across a number of different agencies, a number of different programs. I think we have done a good job lately talking to each other, but there's nothing that is really formal to encapsulate that. So we're trying to get to a place where we're looking forward into the future. We're able to continue these conversations to continue to coordinate um, and move the ball forward on that. Uh, meetings are open to the public, so even if you're not on that and you want to hang around uh, for the afternoon session, I uh, would encourage you to do that. I uh, want to turn next to the Community Flood Preparedness Fund and the Resilient Virginia Revolving Fund. Um, so we are putting out the draft manuals for the flood fund and the revolving fund uh, targeted next week. Um, this is something that we committed to from an administrative standpoint for uh, transparency purposes. Um, we do anticipate some good comment from the folks in this room and elsewhere and are looking forward to that. Uh, another uh, kind of a couple of reorienting I would put it, of the program. So these are two distinct programs. They are aimed at, at similar things, um, but our goal is to have the Community Flood Preparedness Fund really fit into the community scale lane, um, larger projects, community benefit, teeing up um, localities' abilities to handle these projects. Um, we will continue to emphasize planning activities um, going forward as we have in the past. On the other hand, the revolving fund uh, is geared more towards property scale, uh, projects, uh, hazard mitigation buildings of property. Um, it is primarily loan oriented, whereas the CFPF right now is primarily grant oriented, though they can both do loans and, uh, and grants. Uh, we are able to use a revolving fund to leverage federal dollars, so we do step outside of the property scale uh, lane a little bit when we're able to draw down federal funds. Um, one example of that is FEMA's storm program, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later, matters at the next meeting. 
we have an update on the support under the Hyundai report, um, which is able to capitalize the following funds. Uh, so those are kind of the two general uh, lanes that they're going to go in. Uh, I'm going to have more to say about the specific buckets at the uh, annual coordination meeting tomorrow. Uh, so teasing that out if people want to show up for that. But again, I anticipate those draft manuals go out for public comment uh, next week. Uh, 30 days. So the, the timeline on that is a we'll do a 30 day review period and then the goal would be to have a uh, 60 day application period um, September. Yeah, September, October, October. And then awards at the end. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. So for the um, for the manual. Mm -hmm. So it is two separate manuals. It is two separate manuals. We had hoped that we could do a manual, but digging into the statutory language with both programs, there's enough difference between the two of them that it made it really difficult to combine. So they will look very similar, um, but they are they are two distinct manuals. The plan is to have them come out together to have rounds open um, at the same time. Okay, and then um, if it's possible to go to the previous slide, Matt, thank you. So for the last bullet under the revolving fund, mm -hmm. so the projects identified in the master plan or the coastal resilience master plan, aren't those projects also prioritized in the CFPF? Yeah, so there is, um, there is overlap between the two programs. And I think some of that is just due to the broad nature of the statutory authorization. Um, and so as, as those programs develop, we may see the revolving funds start to, to dabble in that a little bit, but I think our intent is to, to the degree we can, keep the community flood fund focused on those community efforts that are probably gonna be the ones that are identified in the plans and the revolving fund on the property scale. So is this an error then? The no, that, that, that pulls straight from the statute. Oh, so they're both they're both all that is what they are authorized to do. Okay. I just want to be sure that we're telling um, you know local staff mm -hmm. that they're okay to use CFPF funds if there's a project listed. And so to when we talk a little bit more about it tomorrow, I'll have the specific buckets. Um, and we're we're a, a little we're trying to, to anticipate a little bit because of the size of the, the revolving fund. Right now versus what maybe right. coming down the pike on it. So we may not operationalize all parts of all of those bullets, but it's just a list of the things that we can. Okay. Yeah. And the sorry to That's keep going to my last question. Um, the property scale, the first couple bullets mm -hmm. could be achieved through grants and the revolving fund fund, and then the others would be achieved through loans. So the revolving fund is authorized to provide grants and loans for a whole host of things. Right. Um, you'll have to wait until tomorrow here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Private industry, any engineering, like you want to contract it or like work on private property? So there is language in the revolving fund statute that requires us to prioritize projects that I can't remember the language off the top of my head, essentially leverage the use of private industry for operation and maintenance and project costs when there are benefits over the government. Okay. It wouldn't matter if the government was just contracting to private. You're, are you trying to give revolving funds to a private directly? No, the revolving fund has to do it. I just a little confusing with priority hour. Moving on to the next agenda item is our old business section. We have three items to cover today. Um, one is the black city infrastructure law, resilience implementation improvement plan updates on uh, the update in a minute. Uh, we're also going to have an update on the FEMA's form program and other FEMA funding. But on that, the uh, proposed tax charter changes. 
First up is the bipartisan infrastructure law of Congress. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Again, Chris Watson, VDOT. Uh, in terms of old business, I think at the last meeting we discussed that we would come back with an update on, from a national perspective, how other state DOTs and MPOs were uh, where they were within the process of developing their resilience improvement plan. Uh, just in terms of background, the bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure law, or IIJAs, it's also now sort of incentivized state DOTs and MPOs to develop resilience improvement plans. Um, and they did that from a financial perspective. Not only would a RIP help inform decision making, but there's financial incentive for states to move forward with a RIP. It can help from a formula based money perspective, help lower a state's non federal match requirements. And there's also preference given to the discretionary grants uh, where states have developed RIPs. So we wanted to see what was happening at the national scale. So we have seen uh, just about every state is moving forward with the development of a RIP uh, to some level or another. Uh, we've also seen states that already have a climate action plan in place. They're really drawing from that to sort of start the RIP efforts. Uh, so drawn connection to previously uh, planning efforts. At this time, we're not aware of any state of actually going through the RIP process with Federal Highway and getting approval from them. Uh, to our knowledge, Kentucky DOT is the only one that has truly submitted a formal RIP for Federal Highways review and uh, approval. We have in VDOT submitted our resilience plan. I think everyone's aware we presented that on previous meetings. Uh, we presented that just informally to see where they see us aligning with the RIP requirements. There are specific requirements laid out in the bill. And we've gotten some of those comments back uh, and we're working through those. And our challenges are really what we're seeing at a national level, very consistent. Um, challenges. So three that we've itemized here is consistency with the state hazard mitigation plan. We work very closely with VDEM uh, right beside me um, when they just recently updated uh, the plan earlier this year and we did uh, specifically cite VDOT's resilience plan. So we're confident that we can work through that with Federal Highway. There is a coordination uh, requirement to include long-range transportation plan uh, inclusion. We are working through that right now. That was a shortcoming of our plan, if you will. Uh, and then also the risk based assessment. Um, really, a need to have a statewide coverage versus specific corridors or regions with all the work that's happening within VDOT and with this group and other state level efforts. We're confident we can work through that as well. And then I just wanted to point individuals that are interested to a very good portal that's being maintained on a national level about what RIPs are out there or where states are within the process. Our plan is up there. Uh, you can see Vermont is moving forward with their process. So it's a good insight to where every state is and their efforts. And it's maintained by ASHTA, which is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, uh, BDOT and other state of DOTs are very active uh, in that organization. So, any questions or hand it back to Matt? So I just was curious, uh, the state hazard mitigation plan, is it that it doesn't have as much detail regarding VDOT as they wanted? Or like what's, why is it a challenge? That they weren't, uh, the connections weren't made. There wasn't a plan um, that the state didn't have a resilience plan or a RIP. Uh, so the other state mitigation plans were kind of silent. So you you have to write the RIP so then the state mitigation plan can say that references? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that, I think That's what they want they want to see a connection that the two are working in concert with one another. But your your VDOT plan doesn't have to reflect details that are in the state mitigation plan. No, they just want to see their coordinated efforts. Any other questions? Next up is Adima Storm and other funding updates from Ina. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Um, so FEMA Storm, uh, we submitted seven applications back in April um, and haven't heard anything back from FEMA yet. So I think being that this is their first year of this program, I'm not surprised um, on their review process. Um, not hearing anything for a couple months, uh, but uh, if we have any updates, we will certainly uh, report that to you at the next uh, time meeting. Um, just wanted to point out there are three uh, significant projects that are in the Coastal Resilience Master Plan that are um, either funded or going to be funded by FEMA. Uh, they're listed here. Um, the City of Virginia Beach Eastern Short Drive project that was uh, selected uh, in the BRIC 2021 cycle. Those of you who don't know, BRIC is the Building Resilience Infrastructure and Communities Grant. Um, the City of Hampton submitted a uh, grant application for their North Carolina Avenue Resiliency Project. That was submitted through the significant pot of funding we had through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program from COVID-19. Um, and then the City of Portsmouth Old Town Road Pump Station Project was funded through uh, the defunct Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant Program in 2019. So just wanted to point those out. Um, we also just received uh, six or seven awards from FEMA for uh, planning districts to update regional hazard mitigation plans across state. Um, so those updates uh, are required every five years. Uh, so just wanted folks to be aware that uh, funding is coming down for those. Um, that's about all I need to update at this point in time. Any questions for Ryan? Okay, we'll move on to the all right, the next item under the old business agenda item is proposed tag charter changes. At our March meeting, there were some questions about uh, subcommittees, and whether there'll be more opportunities for virtual participation as well as all virtual meetings. Um, so we went back, reviewed the tag charter, looked at the guidance, worked with our Republican team, and did find there are some opportunities to increase remote participation and to have all virtual meetings. And so there is an updated um, version of the tax order in your handouts. It's the last uh, six or seven pages. It's uh, with the, it shows you the markups that we're proposing and that we'll be discussing about. Um, so first is policy for remote participation and tax meeting. The current order currently allows um, Remote participation for personal reasons, given that you notice the chair and that you do not have more than one of those uh, occurrences a year. Uh, and there's also uh, exceptions for uh, medical uh, disabilities and other reasons. There is a new item that we were able to add, which is if the member's principal residence is more than 60 miles from the meeting location. You are permitted to attend virtually, and there is no limitation on the number of meetings you can use that. So that is a proposed add-on to help with some people that are to travel down Eastern Shore, Northern Virginia, or Washington. So we'd be having a hybrid meeting, which have additional remote participation. So that is a proposed change um, for the uh, any questions on that before we get to all the questions? Okay. Um, policy changes. We do not have all virtual meetings included in the section. So, this is a completely new section that's been added. Um, you are allowed to have up to two all virtual meetings on a common year, right as you notice it, and it's a virtual meeting. Um, and Provide access to the general public. You cannot, you can only have it for up to two or 25%, uh, whichever is the greater. So we could have up to two TAC meetings or up to two an individual subcommittee's meetings per calendar year. Those all virtual meetings cannot happen consecutively or back to back. So if you have a Q2, uh, subcommittee meeting that's all virtual, Q3 could not be all. So that is a new section uh, that we've added, knowing 
like that. They support subcommittee meetings. They both travel to all these meetings for you know, on a quarterly basis. So these are some of the proposed changes uh, that we drafted uh, based on your comments at the March meeting. Uh, there's some other minor uh, changes and clarifications in the chat charter as well. Um, that's in the red line. Um, um, the tax charter, as far as how we vote on it, we have to uh, discuss it at a meeting and then agree to put it on the next meeting's agenda to be voted on. Then once it's voted on, it can be used and utilized for moving forward. Any questions or comments on the proposed tax charter changes? Very good. Mary um, Is it a policy that we have to discuss it in a full meeting and then vote in a subsequent meeting, or could we make a motion to discuss it and vote today? Yeah, it'll be a subsequent meeting. And so if there are no objections to these proposed charges, and you can review them. Um, I mean, we can agree to put them on the agenda for our Q3 meeting sometime in September. Thank you. Seeing no objections, we'll go ahead and add that to the agenda. I just have a question. Yes, sir. I'm trying under the section 2.5, I'm trying to reconcile. Um, the first goal and the third are are the the, the maximum of two meetings is that of any two meetings of the first but the third bullet says these limitations all apply separately with respect to the meetings of each of them. Right. So, so so we have four ten meetings with quarterly. So that's separate than the subcommittee. Okay. And each individual subcommittee has their own Okay, great. And it's, um, yes, yeah, 25% or two, and it's whatever is the greater. So we'll take the greater and the two. And so that's what we would have. We have the option to kind of alternate in person, virtual person, virtual for both that and also. We will add that to the agenda. All right. Next item on the agenda is new business. Uh, we have two items under this section. One is the statewide flood protection action plan and the resilience action plan integration. Uh, and then we have another topic on subcommittee charges. So, first, uh, integrating resilience planning. Code states that we need to integrate the post resilience master plan and the statewide Virginia flood protection master plan. It's not just by Apple. And so we have put together a plan and we'll discuss that with you. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of the work that we need to do. Um, also, resilience planning is a small shop. So we'll talk about contract support and how long we'll have resources to get this work done. Um, then we'll go into an update on where we're headed with Coastal Protection Action Plan Phase 2, uh, works with the Virginia Flood Protection Action Plan, and then lastly, uh, Community Outreach Mediation Plan to support these plans. So, first up, contracts and support, and what is our approach to getting additional resources for our team uh, to do this? Um, we plan on putting out our piece to support our efforts to add additional resources to do this work that we need. And so we are working on developing a draft RFP right now and anticipate releasing it uh, next month after the review is approved. Uh, it will be a qualification based um, contract. Uh, we can award one or multiple contracts and have multiple contractors on board. So we have a lot of efforts going on, so giving us more flexibility. Uh, kind of this need. Uh, we've also a year contract, um, looking at a three year base contract with optional uh, extensions, um, and then issuing task orders 
with those contract computers that are on board to execute the work that we need. And it allows us the flexibility to not have to develop the scope all front in year one and expect to know what we're doing for the next three years at that time. So flexibility to develop the headquarters based on needs and skills and expertise to support our efforts in the coming years. So again, this is maybe releasing it in July of 2023. There is a notice of future procurement out for this RFP under EVA right now. Uh, it's been out for a few weeks now. Um, and when the release the RFP is issued, it will go out through the state's public procurement process. There are some additional RFPs we may issue as well. Um, IT solutions. Uh, there's a threshold that you would see a certain contract value. That's one potential um, RFP that could come out later this year, as well as a, a more broad flood awareness and outreach uh, for um, building base level knowledge, building awareness of the risk of flooding up for our plans, but for our other divisions within public management and dam safety to help try to drive people towards the planning process that are occurring both locally, regionally, and at the state level. So that's another effort. Uh, here. We still are under contract with Dewberry. We're working under that contract, and the first one that's going to be provided. Um, but that contract is limited uh, with uh, funds that we have, and so we need additional support to deliver phase two of the next plan, the state level plan, and our other resilience programs. So this is a bit of a diagram of how we see these plans integrating and working together over time, where we have our post resilience master plan phase two. Um, which we'll get into some more detail in the next slide. This regional plan feeding into our state plan, and then our state plan informing, laying out our priorities of what we need to do, getting more information and data development so people can continue to implement and update plans and go to more coastal plan, actually some larger other regional plans, as opposed to plans just gave us PDCs. But again, feeding into the Virginia Public Protection Master Plan. Okay, so this kind of feedback cycle of regional plans, feeding the statewide plans, and going back through. Let me give this a first one. Post Virginia Master Plan Phase Two. These are the uh, requirements for code that shall be in uh, Phase Two that is due no later than December. 31st of 2024. Uh, so we have a plan specific plan for mitigating severe potential flooding. It needs to incorporate all major flood hazards. So marine flooding, fluvial flooding, uh, precipitation driven fluvial flooding, and our coastal flood hazards. Uh, comprehensive risk assessment of the critical human natural infrastructure, which ties again to our status of um, Resilient report and critical infrastructure assessment, and the list of project updates, as well as implementing our community outreach engagement plan. So that's what we're required to do. Um, this is kind of the breakout of our plan for getting it done for December of 2024 to meet these uh, requirements. Uh, so to incorporate major flood hazards uh, for coastal flooding, utilizing the existing CRMP coastal data. Uh, periphery and fluvial flooding using the existing FEMA fluvial data, and then the rainfall driven fluvial flooding is the work that we're going to undergo. We discussed it earlier, uh, it should be done by spring of uh, next year. Uh, we've also discussed doing some compound flooding, a uh, joint probability analysis that can also be included in this effort uh, for summer. That flood information would then inform where the exposure is for our risk assessment. Uh, that's something we'll be working on next spring through late fall, get ready for the new report. 
um, updating our project inventory. Again, working with the uh, eight coastal PDCs to get their projects in from the coastal zone management uh, funding through the EU and NELA, uh, as well as, and once this web user portal becomes live and functional, you all can add and update projects on the uh, as you mentioned, the projects and the updates. Um, and then we have our outreach mediation or we can add some activities as well as other ongoing outreach mediation activities which can get us to response. I have a question on that one. Yes. That may be more uh, for that. So the coastal PDCs are working to try to get projects in. And then Matt, you had mentioned earlier on the RF, RBR, the mm -hmm. projects identified in the master plan year later. Mm -hmm. um, if the coastal PDCs do not put those projects in, are they not eligible to make application for funding, or is this the carrot to encourage folks to get those projects in? Like you have to have them in there, or you can't make application. And that's that's a really good question. So the slide about the CFPF and the revolving fund, those are what the programs are statutorily authorized to fund. It's not necessarily a descriptive list of what's going to come out in the next rounds. Uh, right now, we are not requiring that projects be in the plans. That may change in the future, but kind of given the limitations of getting projects into the plan, and sort of the nature that how that evolved, I don't know that limiting it at this point is necessarily something that I would be looking to do. Does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah. So again, I would say forward with it, but it's not contingent upon us having every project in that database. No, not not okay. not for the not for this round. And I think right. as, as we move forward, you know, looking at how the revolving fund, the flood fund play into each other and the coast and statewide plan is something that we're going to flesh out. But again, that, that list is a menu of stuff that they can fund, right. not necessarily things that they are going to be able to fund in these rounds. Thank you. Yeah. And one other question, maybe a comment actually, Scott, a comment on this slide. I just, I got a question more thanks to the comment on flooding so you could be considering it. I'd, I'd like to strongly encourage that stay on the list. The question mark is where we had finalized the scope and authorized it, but it's something we're considering for the recommendations. Um, there are a few more slides. This image is repeated, and we talked about that. We don't have the full scope all baked in. We wanted to run, but on all phases, uh, we'll get to that in a few slides. That would be a good have a question about um, the yeah, up there about the existing FEMA fluvial data. So yes, yes. Okay. the HECRAS models and the other things that are already in the adopted the funding for studies that have already been produced. The, yes, what available FEMA data is. So, those are, a lot of those are kind of old now. Um, yes. And the data that they use is even older, um, and they're not looking at the same future scenarios for sea level or for Rainfall that we're looking at for the fluvial flooding. Has there been any discussion about tweaks that can be made to those models to better incorporate those future conditions? Because my concern would be that if we use the existing fluvial models, we have future models for fluvial flooding, we have sea level rise incorporated into coastal flooding, that we have the old stuff for the roof rain, we're not going to get a complete picture of what the various flood risks are. Yes, I mean, we had discussions. This kind of capture as total flood risk. We do a limited schedule and budget, and this is an ongoing process. So, I mean, this is the current plan. Um, again, we will be seeking input from the different subcommittees on some of these items if they have recommendations of what they think may be feasible. Um, some things may be able to get done in this round, some may be then listed as a priority for our next round, but we need to get to it as a set. Thank you. A follow up on and maybe it's for a request. Uh, I think it'd be, it'd be helpful to have maybe this is also for tomorrow's meeting or for that group, but uh, as 
schedule if we have one about what FEMA is planning is for when they're going to update different flood insurance studies. Uh, but also, so getting right here. Uh, so recently, so right now, there's a, there's a current update uh, to the flood insurance maps for Franklin, Southampton, Isle of Wight, and uh, Suffolk. So, uh, but unfortunately, the LIDAR data that was collected for those in 2018, 2019 wasn't finished. So those, that study, that brief that update, is using the data that's now 12 years old. It would be helpful to have, I think, you know, or a better work with FEMA for uh, you know, perhaps to see that we can align our data update schedule to better align with, with FEMA's plans for updating the flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance studies to make sure that uh, we're getting the good data, the better data, the newer data, Ahead of the schedule so that we have it, we don't park in the position where we have a planning study being done, the old data, and then we happen to get the new data right after that. Uh, we're doing that more out of order. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that, that you all have had a chance to discuss with FEMA about where their, their schedule is for the next several years. I think that would be helpful information for us. Yes, we have the schedule where we're looking and Southwest is the biggest focus right now. It's the next uh, grouping of areas. And we all are aware that yes, there are rivers and Hampton roads. There's still fluvial flooding, and that data is on that top But we will like to work with you all to figure what is the best available data that we can use and access to. And then, yes, coordinating moving forward, how do we integrate with what the team is doing? What other so working, flood um, indication modeling, the kind of flood risk management standard, and CISA based approach, and when that data will be available, to try and see when all these data sets are rolled out. So we're going to get jumping on the front and then getting replicated for So building on the outreach engagement, phase two outreach engagement is building on the efforts that we did in phase one. And so we haven't forgotten about the information. We did uh, two different surveys then, um, had a lot of responses both from individuals and organizations. Um, we had a number of meetings regionally and some uh, meetings with some low income and vulnerable communities. Um, so to kind of let what we've learned there, as well as do more to inform this effort um, and try to get that input on our efforts. And so with phase two, we're doing new modeling with the Google. So are there ways to ground through and collect um, verify some of that information if some of the people are experiencing? Based on some of the VDOT, the road connector data that gets submitted from different individuals, um, working to identify critical infrastructure and uh, still identifying the gaps that we have for planning and initiatives, as well as if there's any gaps in the risk picture that would be. Um, our approach to engagement, you know, multiple levels, so engaging with you all. And to get information, we want these plans to help serve your efforts and work a cohesive plan uh, in this coastal region that we're working on. Um, we are working with VM on the critical infrastructure stakeholders group or the critical infrastructure assessment. So that we're not doing two different critical infrastructure assessments, one for ECR, one for VM. So we combine approach to uh, leverage that and Work smarter, not harder. Uh, we don't need to partner with PCs to get more input. Hoping that you all have been partnering with the localities to get input. And the localities are working with the communities and neighborhoods within them and working within the laws of government and because we have limited time resources uh, to get there. But we do plan on supporting uh, locality and direct uh, to community engagement. Um, we will have. Contractors know a lot there. We want to work with the localities and existing efforts that are already going on in the coastal region and not duplicating those efforts. Um, and then we also plan on posting a lot more information online on the web page um, and having uh, 
public information sessions as well, trying to build more awareness of the activities that we are doing uh, in Congress that we are being. So the role of the TAC, um, these are some highlights, and we'll get into this in more detail with our subcommittee uh, discussion. But with our uh, kind of liberal spraying out from code, so first incorporating all major pool hazards, um, there's four subcommittees. So we have project determination, funding, research data and innovation, and outreach and coordination. Subcommittees. We'll pull up the roster for those uh, in a few slides. But where we're looking at right different priorities, looking for input from you all. Um, what do we need for risk assessments, inputs and outputs? What are the questions you want answered to help make informed decisions that matter to you all? We just want to put information out there that's not useful. So let us know what. What are the outputs of the risk assessment that would be helpful for you all to work back and say, well, what input do we have? Can we do this or not? But we just need to know what are the questions you have. Help us with the release database. Help us with that development. What will work for you all? How does it work better with your efforts um, as well as other uh, stakeholders and efforts? So we can use this as a tool to really one of the great things to share that information across this region, save us in visibility, but so all so we'll the residents in those communities and other stakeholders. So how do we work to um, build that database? On the funding subcommittee, what are the questions that we need to answer? Just what is the total need? But maybe what is the total critical infrastructure need? How much money do we need to increase capacity? If that's what we're looking to do. Having more targeted funding questions and if you're looking uh, for input and something, what are the questions that you would answer that um, the people you represent ask, they want to see to it? And we can even get it so that information is better. Research data and innovation subcommittee. So, the flood has a question Are we using the best available data? Are there other options out there? Are we setting ourselves up for success? Should we be using that interval based approach for the Google modeling or should we stay coupled down to school D? Um, these are some of the questions we want to know. Um, help us with the risk assessment analysis. The natural infrastructure was a challenge in phase one. How do we improve the natural infrastructure? What are the impacts we're trying to capture? How do we get the right data to support that effort? And if we don't have it, so that's what we need to continue this and move forward. Um, and if there's any other reason, what we need to And then outreach engagement. Um, again, looking for your input, what we can do for stakeholder mapping, uh, this whole community outreach engagement, how do we do this sustainably? Um, given the resources that we have, how does it work with your own efforts? Again, not wanting to duplicate it and work cohesively. Um, looking to try to capture and understand what local capacity and needs are. So, how do we gather that data effectively? Uh, Maybe it already exists. So we can help, help us help you with these things. Um, the last slide under the outreach and engagement working group. What do you mean by stakeholder mapping? So from the stakeholder mapping, two, there's two kinds of stakeholder mapping. One is geographically. Where are the organizations that are supporting communities outreach and engagement so that we know where we can help get the communication path to them? And also not just geographically, but also those communication pathways that we connect with us. So will the state sending out something? Is it going to PCs, the localities, the neighborhoods? Do we have communicators in place to help spread the message and then also receive information? So geographically managed as well as kind of communication that. All right. So we covered phase two. December 24. Um, beyond that, we have our statewide uh, 
strength of resilience. So, what's our opportunity to be monitoring the effectiveness of a project in real time and feeding back into planning and prioritization and the design of the next project? I don't think we get it right yet. I mean, even the projects that are shovel ready today have been using older data to then that's changing the design. So, we haven't invented yet all of the things we're going to need to be more resilient. So, um, have you been thinking a little bit about what does monitoring of industry projects in real time look like? I'm asking that whether we are in fact getting more resilient and how to inform the next iteration of even design. You see that in here and I just missed it? Or? I do see it in here two ways. Well, two types of things. One, we have a lot of projects, but we also want to look at policies and to build those benefits. But where we are looking at projects, the Coach Resilience Web Explorer, the new user portal that will be updated, one of the fields is the project goals. So we can see that the project go through concepts, planning, permitting, design, to construction. And then that can you go through that page, you can continue to provide updates. So we're hoping to at least capture that information. We have the ability to capture it within the database, but it will be a, a charge to then look at it and have to review find lessons learned, not only us to find it, but then sharing it and hearing from others and trying to share with those lessons learned, I think it's a big part. And, and as a place where the state can act, where if a locality has been successful or has challenges, we don't want other localities in a region or across the Commonwealth to want them to avoid that cost. But I can share those lessons learned and, and challenges. I think it's something we can work on. But we have we have tools that we can use, it may not be a right tool, but we're trying to capture some of the information so we can do that. But I think that's a great point. Yes, we need to evolve. New solutions will be coming out, so we will need to be adaptable or flexible as we continue through the cycle. Now, I got a follow up for the point. Yeah. When you talk about adapting and, and building new solutions for the future, what Troy and I have already been encountering with some of our Go Virginia funding is the current regulatory permitting system that Virginia has used was never designed or contemplated the types of solutions that we are going to need in the future. And so we are watching projects grind to a halt at all different permitting levels. And there probably needs to be some carved out focused attention around the incongruency between the traditional way that projects of everyday norm are permitted versus the new box with a circle in it that you can't get permitted because the system doesn't recognize it. And that, that in and of itself adds a tremendous amount of inefficiency into the space. And um, you can't blame those that are issuing the permit because they've got rules that they have to operate within. But many of these solutions that we're talking about don't fit those rules. And if we're not talking about them and shining light on it, we're just pretending that the problem isn't real. And I think Troy may want to think a little bit on that because that's taking him to some of the project sites where he's been able to debrief with and listen to some of the permitting agencies as they're trying to get their mind around what, what is water management all about? Well, from the, well, from the standpoint of like that, that feedback, right? like innovation is going to be needed in every domain, in regulatory permits and policy domains to be at to the innovation that will be pushing the envelope. Um, I would be monitoring for that to enable that. And I think the statewide plan right now is looking statewide on state policy, and that's an opportunity for that. But I don't want to preclude that from coming up during COVID. So there are needs beyond just projects. So that's kind of how do we organize those needs so that people can understand them? We share that we could be to implement projects, implement policy, and also be challenged as well. As a whole community approach, knowing 
So I'm really glad to see that outreach and engagement efforts will inform this vision. Um, I was wondering if you could describe how that will come together a little bit more. And then also, if it's not intended to come because this is an example slide, how will we discover the vision for Virginia's future? Because this is a, you know, this is a CRMP tax. Are we moving into a tax for this whole statewide plan? Are you looking to us to advise on the mission? Is this the administration's vision? And these are really important issues that will drive decision making for many years to come. So I think it'd be good to have a little bit of a foundation on how this will play out. <laughs> Well, audience. And we do look forward to working with our outreach engagement contractors for what's implemented and how to capture the information. Um, this is the post presenting fact. This is the presentation for how we incorporate the state by plan. We'll let them be some other advisory group for the state by plan. How that happens. So to be determined, but we do want to have a statewide mission of what we're trying to achieve so that we can align to that and point to that and work to that in the coastal and maybe the Piedmont and Mount Valley and the other regional planets that will help support that while still having their own kind of regional so focus. So, so we're not we're not doing that. Vision work. This task. No, no. We're not asking that. Do you know who will do that vision work? We have one. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, just asking the question. The one I am on this approach, it's fine in the approach, and I'm working with the Okay. So there's a lot of details to get worked out. We have probably short time for phase two. A little longer to the state the All right. Next topic. Some of um, First up is the roster. Uh, this was aired back in March. So just the pressure of four different subcommittees and which organizations are in each, as well as um, who is the chair for the different subcommittees. So we are the representation, uh, which is chaired by the Office of Data Governance and Athletics. And, um, we have the funding subcommittee, which is chaired by BRA. And we have the Research Data Innovation Subcommittee, chaired by D2. Okay. And then we have our outreach and coordination uh, subcommittee uh, chaired by the Office of Diversity Opportunity. Um, but there's our subcommittee roster. We have a few advisors um, already called out, Secretary of Education and Navy. Um, but there is opportunity to add more advisors uh, to your time. So what are you looking for? Now that we have who's on what subcommittee, um, you would like there to be a subcommittee meeting prior or next quarterly tag. So our Q3 tag meeting likely to occur in September of this calendar year. Hopefully to have a each of the four subcommittees meet either in July, August, or early September. Again, we have not adopted the tax charter changes. But we cannot adopt those for the next meeting. So it will need to be a public in person meeting. Um, there is still a limited uh, virtual participation options that are still open to the subcommittee members. We have so the chairs and the members are not out there doing this on their own and responsible for all the agenda taking. You have support from DCR as well as DCU's PNG. 
So we are here to help you uh, coordinate when you want to meet and when. Please be on the meeting notice and sending that out on the agenda. Uh, we will help with the calendar invitations, uh, meeting notes, and meeting facilitation. So there is support from subcommittees. Um, at this next subcommittee meeting, or sorry, at your subcommittee meeting, want to report out and some of the things we'd like you to accomplish. Um, one, if you want to identify any additional advisors that you think would be helpful to support your subcommittee efforts. Um, also, report out on uh, some short term recommendations, and we'll get into those in the next slides. Uh, these short term recommendations be needed for the next back meeting, and then what you get recommendations for things you want us to implement into phase two of the coaster for the next semester plan. And then also in the longer term charge, what we can like uh, providing recommendations that would be included in the plan itself for future work. They have a little more time to work on and report on uh, the status of those efforts and then any other items uh, that are discussed. So again, going back to where we see uh, the goal of the data, and this is not a finalized definite list. We can see some other opportunities uh, for input. You all have the opportunity to do that. This is a map line of where we see um, uh, opportunities for input. Uh, go through each um, subcommittee. So these uh, objectives from the subcommittees have been presented previously at a couple of different uh, meetings. We received your input on them. We moved a couple around based on our new integrated plan and the new uh, statewide schedule. And with the objectives listed at the top of the project recommendation subcommittee, helping us inform us about uh, critical infrastructure inventory, uh, what we have to do to identify and closing those gaps that we need um, for future planning efforts. Organization protocols uh, for projects, for needs, for evaluating project alternatives. Uh, so, for our next meeting, um, try to drive towards our updated impact assessment. What are the questions that you all have? What are the outputs that you want from the impact assessment? Um, let us know what are your needs. So we can look and see what input data is available, what we can get it done for phase two in December 24, or if it may be pushed, but at least we want to document what those needs are, what are the questions that you have that you want answers to in this plan. Let us know. Um, long term, some calls about recommendations for prioritizing multi jurisdictional needs and proposed solutions. Beyond the individual PEC, do you share any needs with other PEC, other projects or efforts that you need support? Or that you are supporting? How do we get beyond just the PEC scale and get into a larger regional scale? I understand if there's some consensus required in needs. Um, as well as any more recommendations uh, for the resilience database as well. These are up for discussion. This is kind of just a starting point. Uh, we wanted to discuss each of the subcommittee's short term and long term uh, needs as a group so that we can receive and put together and then have the subcommittees go out and have their first meeting try to work on it before that. So, any thoughts, comments, questions on the project coordination? Okay. Um, and we'll still be open for discussion with your chair and the and we'll work with the discussion. Uh, next, the funding subcommittee. So I help in the state agencies leverage and align the same revenue stream. So we recommend new sources that are needed to help us meet the needs of the plan. Um, I would support local needs and which 
how do we kind of drive more innovation into this process on the funding side? What do we need to do? With that? So, next meeting, again, what are the funding questions that you think this plan should be? And not just what is the need to be more resilient, but how do we drive to some more specifics? What is the need to protect critical infrastructure potentially? What is the need to build capacity? What are the needs we have? How do we, how do we quantify the dollars for these kinds of needs? Um, all term, some recommendations on how we can meet the needs in the coastal region. And this is a collective effort. We want you to be on this. So that's what we have to so for the funding. Any questions, comments? Um, so we've talked a lot about like these two funds at the state level. And so I guess I'm wondering. For the funding subcommittee, should they look at other things like are there USDA programs that help individual private landowners or possibly other BMPs through the cost share program or whatever that should be captured as to a need in this subcommittee? And I'm not sure I know what they all are, but we kind of focused only on these two funds, and I guess I'm trying to figure out how much further does that need to go. <laughs> Yes, so we can. And, um, there's the funding database that goes through things, but it's more of the updated. Um, but if there are some other needs, they may not be our funding sources. They may not be just a resilient funding source, like the annual share. There are efforts that are being done for more quality that benefit those resilience. And so I would highlight that those may bring awareness to those needs. And so, Helping educate people and people. So, yes, that all can be discussed and if there is identified a gap in what we're covering or how we're promoting funding and implementing this, I think that we can implement that something as far as what we need to include in plan or make it even more aware. Matt, most of what you talk about there are related to ongoing programs and funding that have historically been available and reshaping, we're trying to figure out how to take that program and apply it to this context. Alternatively, do you expect or would you want the group to be looking at making recommendations to tax policy changes? Because this, this problem is going away. And if you don't, if we cannot figure out a sustainable and lasting and durable funding stream that's going to require probably recommendations for state tax policy modifications, both at the state level and at the local level, to create the tools to make sure that there's an ever present flow of money. I would suggest if there's a if we can't meet the needs, the current funding opportunities that we have now, but we still have the needs, do you just accept that or do you propose changes? See why you can't think about changes and make recommendations to meet those needs. And we're not, again, collective effort. We're not going to be able to come up with all these solutions ourselves. That's what we're looking for input from you all and potential additional ideas that you think that support this I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm not part of this subcommittee, but I am part of the CZM Shoreline Stakeholder Subcommittee on Funding. How are those two efforts aligning? Because I know they're doing very similar things. And I wouldn't want the effort to be duplicated. Yeah, so that's coming out of the Coastal Management Groups. We are not in it. The Shoreline Stakeholder Subcommittee. I'm aware of it. I mean, Jack Flood. Yeah. Increase coordination. Yeah. So if there is no wall, we can bring them in and see what's going on. We do have the player uh, limitations. We have limitations. We have the player requirements that we need to be aware of. And so when meeting, yeah. uh, you know, it's a committee or something, if there's more than two members meeting and discussing any of this business, mm -hmm. that will trigger all of the other requirements. 
Yeah, I would just encourage you to talk to Jeff because he has some really good information and I know a lot of agencies have been sitting in on the funding committee uh, and, and pulling together what sounds very similar to what you guys are doing here. I wouldn't want it to be two different candidates instead of being here. I'm looking for one as we had the information showing up that we will reach out to Jeff to see if there are people here. Perhaps you have them all or we can so Matt, I'm going to uh, do a little chairman in here. I don't mean to cut off the conversation, but just to note that we do have a couple more slides to get through, and then we're required to provide at least 20 minutes for public comment uh, at the end. Uh, there's a lot of few people in this meeting that are in the meeting that starts with one, so I want to make sure we've got some time for folks to, to clear out. Um, so I do want to move on. To the next slide. Great. Okay. But, but know that if people have feedback on any of these items, I think that's part of the purpose of the first meeting is to scope out other things that they want to talk about. I'm certainly open to feedback. Yes. First, we go along There's some things you need to know. Like, these are the data and the subcommittee. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on Google modeling approach and potentially Google so we can try to incorporate it and implement that moving forward. But then there's some other long term targets that are available. Yes, these are open for discussion in the short term answers. So we, we have we have need for books in the book, but you're more than welcome to add items to that. Any questions on research data organization? And then the last piece is our outreach and coordination subcommittee. And they are working to strengthen relationships uh, with our stakeholders and Having a comprehensive initiation plan for this process. Um, short term, help us with the stakeholder mapping effort with um, uh, other coming. And then any other recommendations for how we should engage in four phase two and help through the uh, center. Uh, long term, how do we take this a sustainable process? We continue planning, but continue seeking input. Putting information out on what we're doing. So, any questions or comments on short term charge and outreach engagement? Again, what we're looking for, uh, me, prior to next decade, so DCR will send uh, a roster with names and emails and checkers. Uh, and we'll work on trying to schedule meetings with you all, put the invitation out, and uh, start having meetings. Uh, reporting on some short term needs, you all can develop some new needs, and uh, know there's things you want us to try to implement into our process for phase two. We need that sooner than later. Um, to schedule. But then also working on some of the recommendations that the subcommittee could provide to be included. In more uh, phase two point. Any other questions or comments on the subcommittees? Yes. So, when you send out the roster, um, would it also include, like, if the invitation or the solicitation for day is going to come from BCR or is it going to come from the chair, just so that we know who the email is coming from? It, uh, you have to be working with us to help provide some facilitation as well. We can let you all know when we send out the direct meeting that's who. I think yeah. typically for FOIA purposes, it would probably come from either us or BCU, um, consistent with the request of communication to the group. Yeah. Okay. And we have been using the Flood Resilience account for a lot of emails. Hopefully, that's not getting called in spam filters. But then it's just. <laughs> but try to add it for public records. I just wanted to make sure, since I am um, in place with John Bateman, that the emails are being sent to me and not. I'm getting his emails, but I just want to make sure that it's swapped over. We have just updated the list on our spreadsheet. So, John Bateman's watch. Any other comments? Are 
public assignment period. Any of the members of the public have signed up to provide public comments? Don't have any sign ups in the deadline. All right. Anybody in the gallery wish to make public comment at this time? Carolyn, do we have anybody online? So we can, we've got a couple minutes here um, that we can allow for, uh, we can provide for tech member discussion. Um, anything you want to bring up, flag, anything you want to revisit quickly, uh, we've probably got about 10 minutes. Um, a couple things. Um, so I think more than a few of us might have gotten the email yesterday that came out about the new First Street Foundation report on flood risk and precipitation driven flooding. And I haven't had a chance to really dive into their methodology, but I think it might be good or it would be helpful, I think, to have either piece of our put together some sort of comparison about like what flood risk models and how that compares to what we're doing at the state here. Uh, that's getting a lot of play in the media. And so I think it'd just be helpful to have that information for us to be able to know what they're, how they're assessing risk, how that might differ from how we're going to be assessing our flood risk. What it really means uh, for us here in Virginia. So that's, that's one thing. And then uh, I have not seen that in the future. We should check out. Yeah, I just told it. Yeah, it just came out, um, and they've, they've been working on their models for quite a while. And that was just another one. They, and their PR folks are quite good at getting these things in, into, the, uh, into the press. So, um, something I think would be helpful for us to have some information on. Um, and then, uh, I guess, in, in better news, um, we. Uh, that PDC and major PC stumbled across an opportunity to work with the USGS to fund the acquisition of new LIDAR data. And I know, um, you know we've talked about the, the data, research and data and innovation, I think is what we're called, the mm -hmm. subcommittee. Um, that data needs are going to be one of the things that we're going to be discussing. Uh, this was an opportunity that the USGS has uh, the 3D elevation program that they work on. They have a broad agency announcement program that allows for state and local governments to apply for assistance. So they contribute some money, and then the USGS and other federal agencies contribute the rest. Uh, it's a really good deal, they got it. Um, and so the HRPDC is funding this uh, ARC, the, the non federal portion for this acquisition. Uh, but I think as, as a model moving forward, that's something that we should be looking at across the cuts across, um, cuts across multiple uh, subcommittees that we're having the, the data subcommittee, but also funding. Uh, and also coordination. I noticed um, we've got a couple of federal agencies on uh, the outreach and coordination group, but I wonder who's have to keep an eye out for other agencies that might be worth bringing in these discussions because uh, they were really excited to be involved. I don't think that there's a lot of awareness about some of these federal assistance programs, so sharing that news could help us cut the cost for a lot of it. I think generally, for if there are other advisors that people feel like we should bring in the subcommittee, that's one thing that I think. Meeting one should cover. So good, good point about leveraging. They are. Anybody else? All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for your participation uh, in attendance today. I want to thank staff. Um, th this is a tremendous amount of work uh, that has gone into thinking through how we approach uh, both the planning uh, for phase two of the statewide plan and, and how we approach doing that in a way that allows us to engage the TAC and to leverage all of you all in your expertise uh, as fully as we can. So I want to thank Matt and Karen um, for, for their excellent work here. Excited to have the people uh, at DCU on board. I'm very excited to have the people at DCU uh, on board. And unless anybody else has any other comments, um, hopefully I'll see some of you all back here in the afternoon or tomorrow. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.